All right, guys, I'm hoping to convince a couple of you guys to buy my new book that comes out today. It's a true story of an Apache named Raphael. It's called Son of Vengeance, Searching for the Legendary Apache Raphael. Uh, basically, the story starts out with this Spanish priest, a guy named Father Navarez, who raises this Apache from a child and teaches him Christianity, Hispanic social customs, in the hopes that Raphael will become an advocate for Christianity. Navarez wants him to go out, teach other Apaches about Catholicism, the Christian God, that type of thing. Instead, Rafael gets mad at the Spanish. He gets arrested for certain reasons. He sort of rankles under these Catholic restrictions. And what he's going to do is turn on the Spanish and go through this terror across northern Mexico. So what he starts doing, he's going to uh, team up with a couple other Apaches and they're going to start raiding Spanish settlements, and they're going to start killing a lot of people. As a matter of fact, Rafael kills more people than pretty much anybody else in North American history. I don't want to say exactly how many people he's responsible for killing, but it's a lot. It's way more than Gacy, H.H. H. Holmes. You've heard about different serial killers. Rafael killed more than them. Well, I don't want to give you the full story here because I'm hoping you'll go out and buy the book. I'm going to put the link to the books on Amazon in the comments. So what I'm going to tell you today is how I discovered this guy. Because up until now, really, really, really nobody has written or talked about this guy before. There's a handful of legends about him in Mexico that you'll see in these really obscure histories. But the guy doesn't even have his own Wikipedia page. So, so how, how did, did I stumble, stumble across, across him? Well, it starts with this, uh, my original book, okay? I wrote a book before this one. It's called Irredondo. It's about the Spanish general, real-life dude, who in 1813 uh, killed half of Texas. He really did. He uh, was way bloodier than the Alamo, that type of thing. Really vengeful dude. Basically, there was a revolution in Texas. He went down there, squashed everything, ruled over Texas, northern Mexico for the next 10 years. Then, when Mexican independence came about, he left. Very brutal dude. Very interesting dude, but very brutal. Well, I wanted to follow this up with uh, the story of another guy in a similar position. So, Erdogan was a commandant general, which basically meant that he was in charge of all of northern Mexico. So, there's this huge chunk of uh, area right here. So, I thought, if Erdogan was interesting, the guy that came before him was probably going to be just as interesting, because that guy had to deal with... Americans purchasing Louisiana and had to deal with Lewis and Clark, guys like that. So this guy's name was Commandant General Demesio Salcedo. Started working on Salcedo. He was involved in a ton of crazy stuff. Almost got into a war with the United States in 1806. Had to try to arrest Lewis and Clark. Did arrest some Americans who came through uh, the internal provinces, which is where the Commandant Generals ruled. Um, but for the most part, Salcedo was boring. The guy did everything by the book. Like, if, you know, Americans are threatening to invade, he wouldn't make the decision himself. He'd sort of say, well, what do I do, Viceroy, or what do I do, King? And if, you know, like, had an issue with money, well, what does the law say? Very practical, very exciting because he's involved in so much history, but also very, very boring a uh, consummate bureaucrat, okay? Um, so I started writing this book, and I actually got 500 pages. I'm hoping to publish this thing eventually, but I got tired of it after a while. After a couple of years, I'm like, I can't do with Salcedo anymore. The guy is too bureaucratic, too boring. I need sort of, you know, dangerous people like Arredondo. Well, while I was going through Salcedo's stuff, he basically wrote this long uh, memoir, is what he would call it, for his successor. So he would eventually get to Arredondo, but it's basically these are all the problems I faced while Commandant General of uh, Northern New Spain, the internal provinces. Uh, this basically had, all right, I had issues with the United States. I had issues with money. I had issues with Indians. He talks about the Comanches, talks about uh, Tayavayas, Wichita's, all these various groups. Uh, and it's all pretty interesting but one part of it was incredibly interesting, way more interesting than anything else. And that's this section where he talks about these, uh, this group of Indians under this guy named Rafael and Jose Antonio. So what Salcedo says is way more problematic than 
basically entire Indian groups, way more problematic than the Comanches as a whole, way more problematic than the Navajos, are these two Indians, Rafael and Jose Antonio. Now, he says they were initially peaceful, but they broke away. And from that point, they've just been killing people left and right. I can't remember exactly how many people Salcedo estimated they killed, but I think it's in the hundreds. And he's writing this to his successor, basically saying, these guys are dangerous. I've been trying all these measures to stop them, but I haven't been able to stop them. So good luck, whoever takes over for me. So I thought this was interesting when I was writing on Salcedo, but basically he wrote two pages. It's not enough to go off of. And I hadn't heard anything else about this Raphael guy, so I didn't really worry about it. Well, while doing further research on Salcedo, I ran across the memoirs of this guy. This guy's name is Zebulon Pike. So Pike was a follow-up to Lewis and Clark. So Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark to explore the western part of North America, go to the ocean. They made it back. Well, he's going to send shortly thereafter this guy, Zebulon Pike, and he's going to basically say the same thing, except for instead of going on the Missouri River where Lewis and Clark went, Pike was going on the Arkansas River and eventually the Red River, hoping to cross the continent. Well, while on his way, he stumbles into Spanish territory, the Spanish are already worried about the Americans sort of exaggerating what the Louisiana Purchase meant to try and take Texas and New Mexico. So the Spanish arrest Pike, they bring him before uh, Salcedo. Pike is going to spend um, a couple months in Spanish territory. So New Mexico, Chihuahua, Cohila, eventually Texas. And then uh, Salcedo will say, get out of here. I'm not going to arrest you. Uh, basically, Pike argues that I just got lost, dude. I'm not, you know, looking for uh, what Salcedo suspected. And he was right is that Pike was gauging Spanish military strength because Jefferson was contemplating invading, stuff like that. But Pike insists that's not what he's doing. Uh, there's also an interesting side story I can't get in here. If some people think Aaron Burr uh, had gotten into Pike's ear because Burr wanted to take over Spanish territory. Really fun stuff. But Salcedo knows he can't keep Pike in here because Jefferson will get mad that he has these Americans under arrest who are under official American orders. Salcedo doesn't want... Uh, to keep Pike um, uh, in jail because basically uh, uh, Jefferson can use it as a reason to invade. So he sends Pike back. Well, when Pike returns to the United States, he publishes these maps, these memoirs of his time spent in uh, northern Mexico. And he's going to write a couple pages on this, uh, this guy he's going to call an Apache, uh, an Apache assassin. So if you go to Google Books, these are all public domain. Uh, this was published first time in 1810. So you can find Pike's, you know, basically memoirs of uh, northern Mexico uh, really easily. Well, this one section, he talks about this guy named Ralph. There is in the province of Cohila, uh, that could also mean Gua Guajuquilla, which is also another uh, possible explanation for that word. A partisan by the name of Ralph, who they calculate has killed more than 300 persons. He comes into the towns under the skies of a peasant, buys provisions, goes to the gambling tables and to mass, and before he leaves the village, he is sure to kill some person or carry off a woman, which he has frequently done. Sometimes he joins people traveling on the road, insinuates himself into their confidence, and takes his opportunity to assassinate them. He is only 600 followers, and from the knowledge of the country, activity, and cunning, he keeps about 300 Spanish dragoons continually employed. The government has offered $1,000 uh, 1,000 pesos uh, for his head. So he talks about this guy named Ralph. As I'm reading this and researching, researching Salcedo, I realize there's nobody in Mexico named Ralph, especially at this time. He's probably talking about the same Rafael guy. So I've got uh, Salcedo saying this Rafael guy's killing hundreds of people. Now I have Pike saying the same thing. He learned it while he was down there. So I start looking into this more. And I find this book that was published in 1856. It's a uh, basically a documentary history of Chihuahua up to that point. So what this guy did, he just collected a lot of old Spanish documents, Mexican documents about the history of Chihuahua. Well, in one section, he basically published this, this uh, how would you say, this collection put together by this guy named Bustamante, in 1810 that Salcedo asked Bustamante to put together 
And what these, this is is basically a calendar or a list of every single person that Raphael killed, injured, uh, and kidnapped. So you see that right here, deaths, injuries, captives uh, in Spanish. And this is basically a very methodical listing of, you know, again, what Raphael did to kill a person, where he robbed people. Uh, this was put together by these Spanish bureaucrats, uh, Bustamante in particular. So I looked through this thing. This is a couple dozen pages. So now I had a list of all of Raphael's crimes or a good chunk of them. And I'm thinking, all right, now I have Pike. Now, now I, I have Salcedo's uh, writing, writing about this dude. dude. Now, now I have this very detailed document. Is there anything more out there on the sky? So, so what I did was I went to Family Search. I don't know if any of you guys ever do genealogy stuff, but the Church of Latter-day Saints, I don't know their belief, but I believe they think that they can link everybody back to uh, Jesus through this genealogy. So they send missionaries out all throughout the world to basically record just about everybody's death, you know, uh, birth, death they can find. And in Mexico, they have a ton of stuff because the Catholic Church was really, really methodical in, in uh, recording who died, when, where, uh, uh, date of birth, that type of thing. So they went and looked through all these old books. And I started looking through these things because if you go to Family Search, you can look at all these old documents. They have them all listed. They've all digitized everything as well. And I started looking at these death records from uh, Chihuahua and Durango. And I started finding things like this. Um, this basically is a Spanish priest. Priests, uh, uh, Catholic priests are supposed to write down um, whether a person received the sacraments before they died. And occasionally, if they, especially if they didn't receive the sacraments, they write, why not? You know, what happened that this person wasn't able to do this? And I started noticing on a lot of these that uh, the reason that people weren't able to receive the sacraments is because... Uh, they, and this is an example of this, uh, did not receive the sacraments because they were killed in the countryside uh, by El Indio Barbaro Rafael. So the barbarous Indian Rafael killed them. And I start looking through these documents. I find hundreds of, well, over a hundred, uh, that are going to be listing either Rafael, Apaches, Indios, and almost all of them line up with the deaths listed in this document. Um, from 1810 that was republished in 1856. So this is two different sources saying this guy killed at least dozens of people, hundreds of people uh, probably. So what I started to do was look at different areas, uh, different archives to find if I could find more. Went to SMU, started looking at um, uh, microfilms, started finding stuff like this. This is basically soldiers set off in search of Raphael, and they're talking about we went to this place, we weren't able to find somebody, uh, you know, uh, he attacked somebody here, but then he got away. And a lot of them are explaining the methodology he used, you know, like he was dressing as Paisanos, I believe that's what this one says. Trace Apaches, uh, Apaches um, in the, basically the dress of country people. Um, and so what Raphael would do is he would dress like just a normal villager or whatever, go say hi to another villager, this guy like, oh, hey, what's up, buddy? Then Raphael would uh, uh, kill him along with his companions. Uh, he would also dress as soldiers. I don't want to give you too much information, but I found more confirmation here at SMU. Went to El Paso, uh, UTEP, went to a couple archives in New Mexico. Found the same thing. There's a lot of stuff on this dude. So what I started to do at that point was I said, forget the Salcedo book. I started writing about Raphael and basically spent the next couple of years putting this story together of this guy that really killed more people than just about anybody else in world history. Um, and he would use these crazy inventions to do it. You know, a lot of people think Apaches, uh, especially the Spanish at the time, oh, they're backwards, they don't, they're barbarians, they don't know anything. This guy would come up with ingenious stuff to uh, attack these soldiers, these sort of inventions that allowed him to rob much more efficiently. Really, really uh, uh, exciting dude. A, crazy dude. Um, one of the other things I found about him was uh, there are all these legends in northern Mexico about him. Like a lot of uh, people, if you just Google El Indio Rafael, uh, you're probably not going to find anything specifically on him, at least not for the first couple pages. 
but you'll find like people's Facebook page talking about like, uh, my mom told me a story of El Indio Rafael. So basically what I did was I combined all these archival sources with uh, the information from that book, with the information from Pike, uh, with these folk legends uh, to get my book. And it details basically this multi-year raids by Rafael across uh, northern uh, New Spain, uh, northern Mexico. Uh, and I'm not going to give you the exact dates because I don't want to say exactly what happens. But, ba well, don't look at this screen because I don't want you guys to see the dates. But uh, uh, when it ends, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to show the end of it. But basically you can see here, uh, what I've done is I took that information from Bustamante and I put it in GIS and I chronicled every single murder uh, that we know for sure. And this is in all his murders because there's a, subtle, a couple I mentioned in the book that were not recorded by Bustamante. Uh, but you see here, um, I mean, this is within a couple days he would murder somebody. Usually you see these in like little spurts, like uh, starts attacking people. Then the Spanish soldier starts coming after him. He moves to a different location. Then, uh, you know, starts picking it up again, goes to another location, uh, starts getting really crazy, uh, 1807. Uh, and he's attacking not just people that would consider themselves Spanish, but like Indians. So people in northern Mexico that are Terahumara, uh, Tepehuane, and all these groups that have adopted Spanish customs, but, you know, are Indian genetically. Uh, he's attacking them as well. These Spanish soldiers are going out trying to capture Rafael. Uh, but he keeps getting away time after time. So the story of the book is, uh, and again, part of the reason is he would dress like uh, people around the area, spoke Spanish, so he can get away with it. So what I'm basically put together is a true crime story based on archives. I'm hoping that you guys will like it. It's um, published with OU Press. Um, you can find it on Amazon. Again, I'll put a link in the comments. Uh, and... Get the paperback version. There's a hard version. Uh, I think that's just for libraries. The paperback, same stuff is in the hard copy. So um, get the cheaper one. It's not, I don't make, I'll be honest, I don't make much money off this. I make like a dollar a book or something like that. Uh, so the real reason I want this, I want to get the story out there because I think it's incredibly interesting. And also, as a true crime fan, I hate seeing the same dumb criminals over and over again. People keep talking about John Wayne Gacy. They keep talking about uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, stuff like that. I'm sure, those guys are interesting, but there are other dudes out there with their own unique story. Uh, and, and this is an example. This is a guy that if you look at the archives, you put in a little bit of work, you find this crazy story. I bet there's other people, maybe not as deadly as this dude, but uh, I bet there's a couple other people out there that are, are maybe close that we just don't focus on because we're, we're looking at the same people over and over again. So I hope you guys check this out. If you don't, no problem. Uh, a very quick update on the, uh, uh, the other videos. I'm hoping to uh, put together a, uh, a more detailed versions of the videos with professional editing, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that, but my plan would be to start over Christmas. So uh, you'll have more professional uh, videos here to replace the, the old ones I put up before. Uh, maybe I'll have an update on that soon. So anyway, guys, please check this out. Thank you guys for listening.